tenants have just a fraction of the rights that they once had. A fundamental shift that has to happen was the idea of housing as a human right. Ideologically, we, we need to make that move. Everybody thinks they can be a landlord all of a sudden, whether it's through something like Airbnb. We see ads for like Bitcoin investment kind of thing, but now we're seeing ads like social media ads and things for like becoming a landlord basically. With the affordability crisis, many people are, are simply unable to leave abusive situations. So I think gentrification really puts and keeps women in danger. Hi, I'm David Madden. I teach sociology and urban studies at the London School of Economics, and I'm here today with Leslie Kern, who is a professor of geography and women's and gender studies at Mount Allison University. And we're here to talk about her new book, Gentrification is Inevitable and Other Lies. Um, so thanks for coming to speak with me. Um, I wanted to start with just some really basic sort of conceptual questions. How do you define gentrification? How, how do you understand what it is? Great. Uh, well, I understand gentrification as uh, a, a process of social, cultural, and economic transformation of neighborhoods that takes a, a neighborhood from um, a working class, minority community into something that has been taken over by um, either middle class or whiter inhabitants. Um, but these days, we, we could also say uh, taken over by um, investment capital, banking, um, foreign speculation, uh, urban developers, and, and so on. So essentially, a, a transformational pro process that uh, often displaces longtime residents in favor of uh, spaces and inhabitants that bring uh, more profit-making potential to a neighborhood. Yeah, so it's 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 a variety of urban change, and one that 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 is is really sort of defined by, I mean, by 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 what is it? I mean, and that's actually what a lot of of, of the book is about, is trying to sort of describe its its contours. But what 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 yeah. what, what would you say are the, the sort of hallmarks of of gentrification as a form of urban change? Yeah, and, and it's, you know, here in the second decade of the 21st century, it's become an increasingly difficult question to answer because there's so many facets of gentrification. You know, if we think back to its original definition in the 1960s of this kind of tiptoeing, household by household, middle class movement into working class neighborhoods, that almost seems quaint now compared to the kind of large scale and very rapid transformations that are happening. So I think we still see that kind of slow neighborhood level change occurring in some places. But now we also have, um, you know, corporate led luxury high rise apartment developments in cities around the world, whether they're condominiums or other forms of, of ownership opportunities and these don't you know tiptoe anywhere they're absolutely massive physical and social transformations of neighborhoods we have um the 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 local state i think involved in pushing gentrification often under uh warmer fuzzier terms like regeneration and renewal and revitalization because nobody likes to to say the word gentrification uh, but it's it's seen as a way of increasing, you know, the property tax base of a city, of bringing in new kind of sources of potential economic revenue and growth. Uh, so cities kind of will actively facilitate gentrification through tax incentives for developers and other kinds of policies or lack of regulation that really makes uh, new development uh, attractive. Um, for people, well, at the same time, decreasing the ability of, of working class and poor residents to stay put through weakening tenant legislations and, um, you know, the cost of living uh, rising at the same time. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question yet about what are the, the hallmark <laughs> features, but I think if we uh, think about what we kind of notice in the physical landscape around us, we will notice a change in the kinds of housing that are being provided, a change in the cost of housing, and also a change in the nature of the uh, businesses and services and other kinds of amenities in a neighborhood, often the arrival of even, you know, things like basic services like groceries, but these can be 
uh, hugely upscaled through the arrival of, you know, organic supermarkets or kind of niche retailers that start to make the overall cost of living um, often prohibitive for many uh, longer term, lower income residents in, in a community. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the one of the really useful formulations you have in this book is that you say that gentrification is all about power. It's about mm-hmm. producing urban space and producing a type of city for more powerful city dwellers. Um, and I think that really encapsulates all of the different forms of of urban change that we sort of talk about when we when we talk about gentrification. Um, actually, one, one of the one of the really useful things that you say in this book is that we need to take an intersectional lens when we understand gentrification and when we try to to identify it and try to understand its harms. Um, I was wondering if you could just speak a bit about what that what that means and and how that expands our understanding of, it, of the concept. Yeah, well, thank you for reminding me of my <laughs> comments about gentrification is, is about power. Uh, yes, a, a simple but I think um, effective way to put it and also a formulation that does uh, allow us, I think, to take this intersectional approach. So as as you know, and probably you know many many people watching today will know, we we usually will talk about gentrification in terms of a class based change. It's built right into the word itself that Ruth Glass coined gentry, right? So identifying right from the start that there is a kind of class based transformation. But as we know, class is not the only system of of power and, and oppression that operates in cities, and it is never operating on its own. So we can't, I think, uh, really understand how class operates without also understanding how racial power operates. Because if we think about many cities, um, there, there, there are often uh, divisions or different geographies of, of race and racial segregation in cities. So these are very key to how and where gentrification happens or doesn't happen. Uh, gender, you know, I'm a feminist geographer, so gender is kind of my entry point really into thinking about cities. And uh, my, my perspective is that, you know, not only are women particularly vulnerable to gentrification and affected by it in particular ways, but that gentrification is a a form of consolidation of um, male power, right? And of course that intersects with class and race. And in the book, I also tried to pull out perhaps some of the lesser studied um, forms of of, um, disadvantage that I think uh, are connected to gentrification, such as age and disability. Again, thinking about communities that are particularly vulnerable to gentrification and likely to um, experience a wide range of very harmful impacts of gentrification. Uh, Disabled people and seniors are really high on that list and yet often not given a lot of attention when we think about the potential impacts of gentrification. So to me, taking this intersectional approach is not about saying, oh, class, it doesn't matter. I clearly think it, it matters a great deal. But ultimately, I want us to be able to, you know, understand all of the the ways that this process is working so that we can, can have a better handle on it and we can come up with more ways to counter it. And we can, uh, for those of us that, that want to see a different way of life in cities, that we can find solidarity across a range of different interests and causes that um, that we're passionate about. Yeah, and, and I think seeing it in that light really does expand uh, the potential to create alliances and coalitions to try to have a more democratized form of, of urban development. Um, but let's talk a bit about some of these details. I mean, you, you as you say, um, you, you write that gentrification has always been a feminist issue. Um, what are... What are some of the specific ways that it, that it is a feminist issue, and what what are the, some of the connections between, say, patriarchy, or gendered violence, um, uh, and gentrification? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, 
housing and, and the home, I think, has always been a feminist concern, in part because of this, you know, longstanding idea of a, a division of public and private and association of women with the home and, and so on. So we, we kind of have that long history of thinking about uh, the home from uh, a range of, of kind of feminist questions. And certainly feminists have been interested in gentrification kind of since the beginning of, of studies of gentrification. And initially, um, you know, people people wondered, uh, would gentrification be um, like a positive development for women who were feeling, you know, very isolated in the city, had less access to services and places of employment? Maybe this return to city living would be like... Um, uh, part of kind of second wave feminism, right? A, a, um, a way for women to kind of break out of being, you know, stuck in a in the 1950s housewife kind of, of role. And perhaps for some women that has been the case. But I think now that we have kind of the benefit of many decades of thinking and writing and observing gentrification, we come to see that in fact, uh, many groups of women are are quite negatively impacted by gentrification, uh, women are much more likely to be um, heads of households, uh, as single parents, and that is a tremendous economic burden. And so any increase in the price of housing is going to um, be uh, extremely difficult for those kinds of households to manage. Women are much more likely to be heads of households in public housing. So when public housing is either uh, torn down and replaced by market housing, or when there's a, a lack of new public housing being built, then women are going to be disproportionately impacted by that as well. Uh, women, uh, whether they're you know single parents or not, um, have long been observed to have kind of more complicated day-to-day -day lives in the city. And when women are uh, displaced, women and their families are displaced kind of further and further out of the central city, their day-to-day -day lives become much more difficult to manage because they don't have that close proximity of services. Um, and you mentioned gendered violence, and I think this is really a, a key issue as well. With the affordability crisis of which gentrification is a part, we're seeing um, <clears throat> many situations where women uh, who are abused in the home, and we know this is absolutely uh, rampant, right? Domestic violence is not um, a small niche issue at all. Um, it's it's even more difficult to leave. It's always been difficult to leave, right? There's always been a, a real shortage of services for people fleeing abusive homes. And often those services uh, provide shelter for, you know, weeks at a time, not months or years. And with the prospect of um, really nowhere to go long term. Uh, many people are, are simply unable to leave abusive situations. So I think gentrification really puts and keeps women in danger um, um, in, in the home. Uh, you mentioned patriarchy, as I mentioned a minute ago as well. And, and so one of the things that I think about a lot is, is this question of kind of who is getting more wealthy and powerful from gentrification, right? If we kind of follow the money, it, who are who, who are most likely to be the property owners, the landlords, the uh, managers and CEOs of development companies and investment banks? I mean, these people are still by and large men. And so if we kind of follow the dollar or the or the pound where where it's going, I think we'll see that gentrification is kind of uh, financially lining the, the pockets of men much more so than women. And that is, you know, kind of a key part of consolidating patriarchal power. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I mean, another part of the, of the sort of intersectional approach you take to gentrification is that you say that it is connected to settler colonialism um, and to the, the fate of indigenous communities within cities. Um, can you talk a bit about, about that? Because um, I think that's that is a part of the gentrification discussion that is often not really emphasized. Yes, I would say urban geography in general as a field and probably urban sociology as well has not until quite recently really reckoned with settler colonialism as a key aspect or a key topic that we should be addressing. I, you know, 
come from and write from the Canadian context where questions of settler colonialism, I think, are rightly front of mind for, for many people. So there was no way, I think, for me to write this book and ignore that issue. But I think you're right. Many people have not yet had the chance to kind of put these things together. So hopefully the, the book does, does help to draw some of those through lines for, for folks. Um, maybe I should just define settler colonialism yeah. a little bit, oh, maybe yeah. for, for people who <clears throat> are, are not as familiar with the, the term. So settler colonialism refers to a, a kind of colonialism where the colonizers never left. So if you think about countries like Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, uh, places where uh, there was, was never a kind of anti-colonial moment where, in, in our case, the, the British and to, to a lesser extent, the French uh, did not kind of pack up and leave. But even as we you know, became uh, an independent country, uh, we, we still com completely have the um, cultural, educational, economic, uh, religious institutions that were brought by colonization. Yet, of course, we still have a large and vibrant indigenous community, but a community that has long been marginalized, uh, does not have access to uh, power and is continually struggling for recognition, for rights, for, for territory, for basic services, for even recognition of their humanity, I would, I would argue. So what does all of this have to do with gentrification? Uh, gentrification is a, a property-based process, we could argue, right? That it, it's about the uh, taking and the, the, the owning and the turning a profit from property. And that is, I think, directly tied to settler colonialism, which was a process of turning land into property. Right? And we know private property is a key component of a capitalist economic system. So this, um, yeah, the, 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 the ongoing um, taking and uh, possessing of, of property by settler communities um, through gentrification and, and other processes is, I think, an ongoing form of colonialism. As I talk about in the book, colonization is often used as a metaphor for gentrification, right? In some of the earliest writing about gentrification, authors would say, you know, uh, the middle class are colonizing, you know, X neighborhood of the city. And, and you know, it, 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 it makes sense as a metaphor, but especially in a settler colonial context, I think we have to be really careful about that metaphor because it might erase the fact that, you know, the, the old colonization is still very much ongoing and that gentrification is continuing to kind of further consolidate the dispossession of indigenous people from, from territories in and around cities. Right. It's not merely a metaphor I and mean, it is connected to actual colonialism. Absolutely. And so calling gentrification kind of the new colonialism uh, ignores that that through line, right, that links these uh, hundreds of years of history of colonization to processes that are still going on today and still having a very real impact on Indigenous people. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the language of, of settlement and of colonizing and and of sort of invading and taking space really does pervade i mean both critical perspectives on gentrification and the, the people who are were sort of affirming it um i mean it is interesting the the degree to which the the sort of frontier imaginary is central to all of this i mean this is something obviously that neil smith and lot, lots of critical geographers wrote about but um i think it is still a major part of the way we the way we imagine gentrification Absolutely. And it was um, challenging to write a, a book. And I, I'm sure I probably messed up at some points in the book trying not to use those, <laughs> that kind of language as, as metaphor, um, because I, I, I wanted to um, be, as I say, be kind of careful around uh, not wanting to erase ongoing colonization, but definitely um, even even the, the the term pioneers, right? Gentrifiers have been right. described as as pioneers. Um, yeah, settlers and parts of the city that are um, kind of ripe for gentrification, being 
uh, described in in problematic ways, like like the jungle or you know the urban jungle, right? Yeah. Um, that that again hark back to the idea of kind of you know bringing light to these dark areas, and I think we still see that kind of language very prevalent in kind of media descriptions of you know up and coming neighborhoods um, of of these sort of revitalization processes as though they are taking communities from some kind of like underdeveloped, uncivilized, problematic state of, of I don't know, not quite a state of nature, but like a state of um, chaos and, and sort of imposing a, a welcome order, growth, um, enlightenment. Yeah, pro- progress. Progress, yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, it, it, absolutely. And I mean, you know, one of the things that you that you stress here, I mean, you, you write that how we talk about gentrification matters. Um, and I mean, maybe you can speak a bit about how and why these narratives really impact the urban experience, especially for marginalized city dwellers, for working class and poor communities. I mean, what what difference does it make the way people describe gentrification? Mm. Yeah, I, I do think that the way we speak about and, and label things has a, an impact uh, both on how we understand it, but also on the range of solutions that we might come up with for what to do about it. You know, if you call something a disease, that, that implies a kind of different set of interventions than if you... Um, uh, label it in a, in a different way. So when it comes to gentrification, you know, one of the, the ways that we tend to talk about gentrification and maybe urban development more generally is what I call a kind of a naturalization story, right? The idea that, as you said, that there's a kind of progress that's like built into the DNA of cities, that cities are like natural organisms that are going to grow and develop and evolve in particular kinds of ways and of course when we kind of layer that that onto the 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 ideology of capitalism that we're also steeped in it somehow seems natural that different areas of, of cities will go from a state of being you know disinvested or poor or run down in some way to this kind of like you know higher and better state through a, a linear uh, model of progress and it's very easy to to see that as just normal and natural. And and the impact that that has is that um, it becomes very difficult to challenge those narratives, right? If something is seen as just the natural course of things, then then what are you going to do about it, right? You're you're not going to be able to change it. Um, In terms of the, the communities themselves, I think it's really problematic in terms of like pathologizing um, communities. Uh, it, It tends to result in the idea that the problem is like located in that community or neighborhood itself rather than in broader systemic issues, right? So if we just change this neighborhood, then somehow everything will be different, right? And and again, kind of imposing this this idea that somehow the, the people there, like that community has just failed. It's like failed to develop. So now we're going to through gentrification or revitalization or regeneration or whatever word is going to be used, things are going to be um, improved. So I think that that probably uh, leaves communities feeling uh, extremely uh, disrespected, um, dehumanized, um, seen as you know not fully um, modern, not not having progressed in in the way that they should. So to me, I mean, the, the, the kind of the naturalization story is just one of these problematic ways that we talk about gentrification, but I think it's a really important one to push back against. Yeah, well, it's part of, it, it's part of the way that gentrification is made to seem inevitable um, and, and, and the way that it, it shapes municipal political goals. Um, I mean, I think there's, a, there's a, a politics of problem definition here and... Um, as you say, the 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 sort of gentrification, the the logic of gentrification looks at communities that have been forcibly impoverished and says that they're the problem as opposed to the system that is impoverishing them. Yes, one hundred percent. 
it, it's like, um, you know, and, and I kind of understand the, the like, an impulse in a way to when you see a, a neighborhood that has been, as you say, systemically impoverished, you know, disinvested to want to think about like, okay, how can life be better for people in in this community, right? That's, that is, I think, often what the impulse is from good intentioned people, people in planning, architects, um, you know, even sometimes developers, maybe we'll give them a tiny bit of credit, the odd one who, who kind of has a social vision, if, if you will. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, as you say, we're not really addressing the structural roots of, um, you know, why that, that community came to be in the condition that it was in. Is it, you know, do we trace it back to something like redlining of uh, racialized communities who were not able to access any you know, credit or, or financial support? Do we trace it back to, you know, environmental injustice where communities have been um, subject to having, you know, land, landfills and, and toxic um, polluting industries located next to them? Do we trace it back to uh, policies that, um, you know, have, have led to the decimation of, of social and public housing support, all of these things are, you know, kind of well beyond the community level. And if we don't look at those, then often what ends up happening is that we just kind of shuffle those problems around geographically and don't really um, do anything to change the the foundations of, of the issue. I, I think this really gets at the role of urban knowledge yeah. and urban science and uh, the, the question of what is really considered sort of legitimate and 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 privileged knowledge about the city mm -hmm. uh, do you think that do you think that urban experts and even urban social scientists play a role in in legitimizing gentrification or or making it seem inevitable or natural yeah absolutely I, I think that they that they do um, you know I'm not an urban planner, but the the field of of planning, um, you know, has this notion of sort of raising place to its highest and best use, right? With the idea that uh, ultimately, if you look at a piece of property or a neighborhood block, you want to be seeing what it could be, and and what that means, again, within our capitalist economic system, is is. The, the highest and best use means that the the maximum profit potential of that space, right? So there's always this impulse to be looking uh, to to uh, shift the way that space is being used in order to create kind of more, um, you know, pathways for capital to flow through and to to accumulate. Um, and and I think that is, you know, something that that is like a almost a foundational element of of urban planning and and uh, urban like economics basically and and this certainly has an influence on how we think about the city and and ideas about growth right i mean we we always it always has to be growth 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 <laughs> but it's it's again a particular kind of growth that is always imagined right economic growth not community growth or or social growth or collective growth or the the power of the people right that's that's not the kind of growth we're talking about so these ideas about growth just kind of circulate without us really questioning them we it becomes very common sense that you know a city must grow in order to survive right so uh yeah all of these ways of thinking about the city then you know start to take on that that flavor of common sense of being being natural and being normal um social scientists yeah i mean i think academics can contribute to this as as well even again sometimes when we are uh well-meaning or we have a social justice angle to our work sometimes the work that we do is still quite disconnected from the communities that we uh, purport to care about as the um Black geography scholar Clyde Woods uh, wrote about social scientists. He said that we are sometimes like coroner, coroners, right? We're like conducting autopsies 
on communities. And I think that really resonated for me as a gentrification scholar, where I think there's a tendency to go around looking at what community has been gentrified and almost like sign its death certificate and be like, well, look, you're gentrified now. Um, you know, you're, you're kind of dead and gone, but we can like look and diagnose whatever the problem was. And the problem is always neoliberalism or capitalism or something like that. Uh, without really recognizing like long histories of struggle and the the ongoing struggles that communities are involved in um, without really taking into account how it is that communities see and understand themselves in all of the complicated messiness that that inevitably involves so yeah from a uh, social scientist point of view i think uh, there are a lot of um, problems with the um the typical modes of, of operation that that many of us um, engage with. Hmm. Um, let's let's talk a bit about one of the central one of the central harms of gentrification, which is displacement. And um, you write that we need to adopt multiple understandings uh, multiple understandings of displacement. See see it in its sort of multiplicity and its complexity. Um, Let's talk a bit about what that means and how, how we can understand how displacement is racialized, how displacement is gendered, and all, all the many different forms of displacement. Mm, yeah, yeah. So uh, when, we, when we talk about displacement or we, we hear that term, often the first thing that we're going to think about is physical displacement, right? People being directly or indirectly pushed out of their homes and often out of their neighborhoods. And even today, we say people fully being pushed out of the cities that they live in and forced to go far afield to find places that are affordable for them to, to live. And that, uh, I think, has always been part of the definition of gentrification. And yet it has been uh, a difficult feature to research to quantify um, how do you find the people who've already left right how do you in some ways you're searching for ghosts um, traces of things that have already happened when you're looking for displacement and certainly people's reasons for for moving are often complex they're not single issue um, uh, processes for for many people it's not to say that we shouldn't continue to care about physical displacement, but there are a range of ways that people experience displacement even when they stay in their neighborhood or even when they stay in their home. So I, I write about the idea of sensory displacement, for example. So we know that our neighborhoods are more than you know the buildings and the streets that we walk past or walk down. It's uh, the 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 sites, you know, who's hanging out on the corner. It's the conversations that you have uh, with the people that you pass by or the, the people that, you know, you buy a cup of coffee from in the morning or the person, you know, the, the, the bus driver, the station attendant at the tube station. It's the smells of the different kinds of cooking and food that are coming out of homes and restaurants. It's the sounds, it's the, the, the music that's being played in the streets. It's the languages that are being spoken as, as you move along. So all of these aspects are part of what makes people feel at home, right? They're, they're part of what makes you know that you are part of a community, they're part of your sense of belonging. And gentrification uh, often begins a, a radical shift in those features. So again, even if you stay in your home, um, that cafe on the corner now serves paninis and flat whites instead of, you know, a basic cup of coffee and, and a sandwich. Um, the languages spoken on the street start to change or nobody greets you in your uh, native tongue anymore or people simply don't say hello to you uh, on the street the way that they used to. Um, the kind of music that's being played is uh, dampened down because gentrifiers don't, don't like the sound of, of uh, whatever it is that's that's happening, the smells change as different restaurants come come in. And this is definitely racialized in many instances as we have white gentrifiers coming in who have particular ideas about how neighborhoods should look and feel and taste and, and sound. And, and one of the kind of battlegrounds around gentrification is often over this sensory environment, over um, uh, 
uh, you know, what kinds of noise are, are acceptable and um, what kinds of activities. And, and this can, you know, escalate from beyond the kind of neighborly tensions that we might feel to um, involving the city in terms of bylaw officers and even the police, right? We, we know there are many stories where um, gentrifying neighborhoods um, kind of have this um, literal like policing effect that happens as people either call the police or the police just suddenly are, are there all the time crack, cracking down on things that are now problematic like playing dominoes on the sidewalk or kicking a ball around in the park after hours so the impact that this has on people is a sense of feeling unwelcome in their own neighborhoods again you 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 might be able to afford to stay in your home but if you feel in danger when you walk on the street or you feel unwelcome or you feel like you can't engage with people in the way that you used to you um, can feel a sense of being unhomed right a, a sense of being displaced even while physically in place and i think these are really important elements to think about because gentrification is not you know kind of a one and done moment it's not like new people come in and everybody that used to live there is suddenly gone and it's a completely new place right this is we're talking decades of of gradual transformation and some people will will never leave yet um, they might still have those loss of social networks and those are really it's not just like oh that feels bad although that that is legitimate i think how people feel matters feel but it, it's also material in that we rely on our neighbors um, and the services in our community to survive. I was speaking about seniors and uh, disabled folks earlier, and, and for communities like that, the um, the close proximity of uh, somebody that can, you know, check on you, check on your your wellness, or the close proximity of being able to go and, and get your breakfast from from somewhere nearby. Like these things really matter to people's health. And well-being and when they change can have extremely negative consequences right so it's it's not just displacement is not just a matter of expulsion it can also be a sort of transformation of place in 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 a uh, in a broader way yeah absolutely it's and people can experience a loss of sense of place even while staying in place and so i think that's you know something important for um, us as academics to consider, but also for uh, policymakers to to think about um, and to you know it's a, it's a challenge to find that fine balance between things that that do materially improve a neighborhood. So, for example, more green space or more tree cover or um, widening the pavements. You know, things that that are like largely considered nice amenities to have and that many neglected neighborhoods have, have not had for a long time, but without allowing that to uh, become the kind of uh, the foot in the door of, of rampant gentrification. Um, and, and that's a, a difficult um, line to, to, to walk. Well, um, you say that it's not criticizing and opposing gentrification is not saying people in cities shouldn't have nice things, right? It's more, it's more sort of drawing our attention to the inequality between different neighborhoods and, and different populations in terms of where nice things are, are distributed. And also I think the systems of property that, that make it such that when there are investments in the built environment, some people are going to be displaced. Yes. And absolutely people deserve <laughs> nice things everybody deserves to live in uh clean environmentally sustainable neighborhoods we deserve safe communities we um deserve places to to play and to you know meet with it with our neighbors we deserve good homes to live in and we we deserve uh places of fun and, and leisure and, and all of those things but the question is why have we decided that the only way that communities can get that is through the the private sector um, investing either in, in building uh, new homes or you know redeveloping homes or in um, you know the, the kind of businesses that come in or in public private partnerships that that you know lead to the development of a new green space or some kind of you know riverfront walk or whatever it is that 
is the you know the the, the amenity of the day that that is is popular with um, city builders. We we've decided somehow that gentrification is the only way that that neighborhoods can be improved. I think we really have to push back on that and to again not to be like nostalgic for some romantic past, but to recognize that there there have been moments right in in history and in, in my country and in, in in the UK many other places where. It was seen as a, the collective that the government role, the public's role to um, make these things possible for communities rather than to say, well, we can't do anything about it. Uh, let, let the market handle it. Yeah, I mean, I think when when it's precisely when markets alone are deciding these things um, that this unevenness and this inequality in terms of amenities and in terms of of access to the city uh, really become manifest. I mean, in it, it, with different regimes of property rights, with different modes of urban development, it would be possible to to have public investments that don't then lead to rising rents and, and displacement. Yeah, I would like to think so. Uh, um, you know, we, we see, I think, um, like relatively weak attempts at that now where we have, um, you know, developers, uh, they want to build a, a new tower and the city says, okay, you can build it, but you need to have X amount of kind of square footage of public space or there has to be this little green space or you have to have, you know, 5% of the units be quote unquote affordable. Um, and, and great, but it's so, it's so limited and it, it's so kind of, piecemeal and it's based on this like constant kind of negotiation with the the private sector about what they're willing to kind of provide in order for the right to um, build and to, to make profit out of urban space and I just think you know we, we could have um, could have so much more teeth right more teeth in these um, kinds of, of regulations that would move us towards a situation where uh, you know, yes, if we if we need the private market to, to be involved, OK, but like, why can we not have, um, you know, stronger um, enforcement of, of actual genuine provision of needs for for communities rather than these sort of like, I don't know, little chess pieces that are kind of traded back and forth without really doing anything substantial for for neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, this this brings up a, a really important question, which is, what are the alternatives to gentrification? It's, I, I think it is insufficient for critical critical scholars and social movements to to um, oppose gentrification, you know, without without describing the the type of city that that we want to see. And then that would be more equal, uh, more democratized. Um, you write a bit about community land trusts and cooperatives, um, public housing. And what are some of the some of the alternatives to gentrification? I think the first, well, okay, I won't put an order on it, but a fundamental shift that has to happen, which will probably be a slower shift, but I think is something that we have to keep kind of hammering home is the idea of housing as a human right. And that if we don't fundamentally believe in that and make that a, a policy cornerstone of housing, then we're going to keep kind of just doing more of the same or making, you know, kind of small scale intervention. So to me, that that foundational element of belief in housing as a human right, the same way that at, at least in many places, we believe in healthcare as a universal right, we have uh, we believe in education as as universal right, and it's not to say that those systems are perfect and that there aren't you know inequalities of access. I fully acknowledge that, but housing we we've left you know ninety five percent of it totally to the private market. Or I mean, I'm just kind of throwing a number out there, but we don't have that same at least in in most places idea that you know collectively we should ensure that everybody has um, a a, a a safe and an adequate um, living space in city. So ideologically, we, we need to make that move. Um, but we can also think about these kind of practical interventions that 
already exist. You know, we, we, I hope that there are new things that we can invent, but we can also look to things that, that already exist. So you mentioned housing cooperatives, right? There's a, a long history of cooperative housing in many places, but um, it has usually relied on some form of government partnership to make it possible to build that housing and, and to maintain it. So we do need governments to support that, but cooperative housing is a way for people to uh, collectively own and run um, housing developments. Rent is kept very affordable. In some places, not even called rent. It's called just like a housing payment. Um, and perhaps the most important thing is the stability of, of tenure, right? It's you, you are not at the whim of a landlord who suddenly says, oh, no, I want to rent this apartment to my kids or to my cousin or something like that. It, it's uh, stable and people can really build long term community there. Community land trusts are growing in popularity in, in many places in the U.S., Canada and in, in the U.K., for example. And this is a way, uh, again, to kind of put land uh, and and um, buildings into the, the hands of usually like a nonprofit community run organization, again, usually in partnership with a city government as as well. And the. The nice thing about it is it like creates this breathing room. So often a community land trust will will have a lease on on the the land for something like 99 years, right? Or some reasonably long period of time where things can just like slow down a little bit and communities can have a chance to figure out, okay, what do we actually need? And and maybe some new development is needed. But the idea is that the community is going to figure out first what they want and need and then try to act collectively again can be messy. It's not, not you know, not everybody agrees on, on these things, but it's a more democratic way of uh, moving forward with uh, different kinds of initiatives uh, in the community. So I'm heartened that these are um, growing in, in popularity and seen as a, um, if not a solution to gentrification, then at the very least, like a, a, a way of really slowing it in its, its tracks and giving some power back to the people. Yeah, I mean, as you say, I, I think housing tenure is really at the center of this issue, and I'm just strengthening strengthening the power of of tenants in relationship to landlords and um, making tenancy a less precarious position um, would would go quite a long way to towards reducing displacement and also making making urban neighborhoods seem less desirable to predatory forms of, of urban investment. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, amazing and and really frightening is the, this kind of like almost like a rise of landlordism where everybody thinks they can be a landlord all of a sudden, whether it's through something like Airbnb, where you're, you know, the landlord of short term rental accommodations, but it's become um, you know, you, you, we see ads for like Bitcoin investment kind of thing, but now we're seeing ads like social media ads and things for like becoming a landlord, basically, you know, buying up a, a, a small property or going in with a group of investors, which might just be like your buddies, basically, <laughs> you know, you're, you're all throwing uh, some, some money in to buy a small building and now you're going to become this like landlord collective. It, it's really seen as like a, a way that almost everybody like should be, be making money. And I think, again, this is like a stark contrast to the idea of housing as a human right. What we seem to be rushing wholesale towards is housing is an investment vehicle. And that if you are not actively profiting from housing and not just like passively, like if, if you're a homeowner kind of passively sitting there letting the value of your home rise, okay, fine. Now it's like, that's not enough. If you are not generating active income from property that you own, then you're like failing in, in the housing market. And so this is something that I'm, I'm kind of concerned about and I don't think is going to lead to an increase in the like quality of landlords, if you will, or <laughs> the, the quality of treatment that tenants get. Yeah. And fintech companies are pushing this yes. a lot as ways that sort of being promoted as a way to sort of democratize housing investment, but it is uh, not a way to democratize the housing system. 
<laughs> no, not not at all. And I, I think it's an extremely scary time to be a renter because in in many places tenant legislation has just been chipped away at or tenant protection legislation has been chipped away at in favor of deregulation and making things easier for landlords and giving less enforcement powers to uh, cities and municipalities so tenants have just um a, a fraction of the rights that they once had in in many places and are uh, struggling to find any form of, of enforcement for just absolutely egregious acts on the parts of, of landlords. And I think uh, now if we have this kind of rush of just like, I don't know, random everyday people like you and me being like, hey, suddenly I'm a landlord. Oh, have I, am I an expert on on, the, on housing legislation? No, it's quite possible that you're going to really mess that up, even if you didn't mean to, right? So I think it's very dangerous housing is so important and yet we've decided that like anybody can be a landlord um and and that's just fine as if we're not like literally playing with people's lives do you think that the category of gentrifier is a useful one for making sense of 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 gentrification politics um because i think that it's uh clearly as as you show and as, as as lots of urban research shows gentrification is central to urban development in lots of places around the world. I mean, it's a global phenomenon as, as, as a lot of scholars recently have been showing. Um, but I think there are important questions about who the, the major agents are. Um, and you know, you talk about gentrifiers in your book in, in a few different places. And I was just wondering if you could reflect a bit about whether or not you think that that term is useful and if so, who should it refer to? Yeah, that's such a great question. As you say, the context of gentrification has evolved so much over uh, several decades that, yes, the the agents, the powerful forces are much more likely to be city governments, policymakers, investment firms, um, foreign capital, like all of these kind of nameless, faceless entities that in some ways feels much harder to um, kind of point at and say you're the problem. Uh, and and to that extent, I think often people will kind of latch on more to the individuals or the individual businesses that they see changing their neighborhoods, whether it's the the hipster or the, you know, the yoga studio owner or the um, moms with their, you know, kind of designer prams. You know, these these are kind of faces that you can point to and say, oh, these people are are changing the neighborhood. And and while I do think we are right to kind of refocus our attention on those larger scale actors, I don't want to completely let, you know, everyday people off the hook here, because I, I do think that the way that as individuals, the way that we act and, and engage um, in, in our communities, the kinds of choices that we make about how we live, who we interact with, what we do with the housing that we have access to. I think those things do matter. And they, we were speaking about sensory displacement earlier. That does have a lot to do with everyday small scale human interaction. So for, for people that find themselves again, perhaps unintentionally in the position of being like a gentrifier, whether it's because you have access to more wealth and resources or because you have Um, a kind of cultural capital or social capital in terms of your education, your profession, or because you are located differently in systems of power because of the color of your skin um, or or other um, advantages that that you might have, you do have some responsibility, right? And and I think you have some agency in terms of the the choices that you make on a day-to-day basis. So we were speaking earlier about um, the choice to call the police when one sees some kind of activity that you uh, feel uncomfortable with. That is a life or death decision that you're potentially making there. So, you know, that's one thing that people could really think carefully uh, about as they uh, move into different kinds of neighborhoods. Uh, The choice to um, 
you know, Airbnb uh, out your home on the weekends while you go back to your mom and dad's place or something, that's also going to have an impact on on the neighborhood in terms of who's coming in and in terms of the um, cost of living and so on. So I think in that sense, the term gentrifier, um, it's still a category that we can speak about because I don't want to lose sight of the fact that um, individual actions um, do have an impact on 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 people. Again, not that an individual gentrifier is the cause of gentrification or the um, or has the the power to stop it, but uh, because you know, they, I think we if we want to imagine better ways of living in collective caring communities uh, with with other humans and with the natural environment uh, around us, we have to, you know, start with ourselves. Well, this this brings me to um, a, a question that that you address towards the end of the book, um, which is, what do you want the readers of your book to do after, after people after people read your critique of of the the myths of gentrification and and come come to this this better understanding about it what do you, how do you want people to respond to it it's interesting because my original plan for the book had it ending at the second to last chapter where i talk about examples of resistance from from cities around the world and i was like that'll be it we'll just we'll be like there's resistance uh there there you go but um it was interesting but maybe not empowering and i was left feeling like i did want to give the reader some idea like literally what can you do beyond saying oh that's interesting that that happened in city x over there um what can you do today so this is where we we can start to consider our actions as fellow city dwellers we can think about the kinds of politics that we engage in the social movements that we want to be a part of the community organizations that we can support, the resources that we have that we can dedicate to different things. And those resources could be knowledge, it could be cash, <laughs> it, it could be time, um, it could be relationships and networks. You know, we, we all have access to some kind of sphere of, of influence that we can uh, try to make a difference in. So what I want people to do, first of all, if, if you are a city dweller and, and you're looking around your neighborhood and maybe it's gentrifying, maybe it's not, but you're concerned about something that, that's going on is to first learn about the place that you're in, especially if you're a relative newcomer, try to understand the, the history of the community. Look to what is already being done. If there is a problem somewhere, somebody's already trying to do something about it. So I think that's really important is to, again, especially if you're relatively new to a neighborhood, figure out what organizations are already working there and seeing if there are resources that you can uh, lend to them. Um, you know, considering uh, the way in which you want to engage with the community, you know, are you like really interrogating motives? Are you in this neighborhood because you see a profit potential and it's just an investment strategy for you? That's to me very problematic. <laughs> or are you in a neighborhood because uh, there's something that you genuinely like about it. And if that's true, then what are you going to do to help preserve that? You know, who are you going to vote for? What letters are you going to write? Um, again, what resources are you going to devote to community organizations? These are all sort of everyday things that people can do. You don't necessarily have to go out and join a squat or become a marching revolutionary. Although if that opportunity presents itself, you know, feel free to take advantage of it. But on a day-to-day -day level, um, the way that you you engage in the neighborhood, I think, is is an important place to start. Yeah, and it and it feeds into broader political institutions as well, and the, and the choices that that the more sort of structural actors are are sort of making, and, and the the sort of political and spatial projects that they're participating in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all uh, you know can make a choice whether to list your property on Airbnb or not, right? And if nobody did that anymore, then <laughs> Airbnb wouldn't have a business, right? So yeah, the, the choices that we 
make it an individual level. And again, I, I never want to suggest that, you know, all this broad social change is, is down to purely down to individual choices. That's not the way that I think about it. But if, if we're thinking, okay, what is, what is a reader of my book? What, what can they take away? You know, at least a starting point is to consider, um, the, what, what changes can, can you make or what are, um, yeah, what, what choices, what power do you have in this situation? And when, what collective practices and projects will you, will you be a part of? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, great. Thanks. Maybe we'll leave it there, but this is really interesting discussion. So thank you so much for your questions. Thank Thank you. you. Yeah.